Welcome to the Gray Area Podcast. My name is Kevin Gray. Thanks for listening today. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. Be sure to download and subscribe to the Gray Area wherever you get your podcast for free. Give it a five star rating and write a review for it while you're there. You can also like and comment on the video if you're watching it on my YouTube channel at Kevin Gray Sports. Be sure to subscribe to my channel as well. Leave a comment. Let me know how you're feeling after Super Bowl Sunday, where the Chiefs win their third Super Bowl in the last five seasons. Mavericks playing some good basketball as well. They made a couple of big trades to be able to get themselves in position for a second half run in the Western Conference. Micah and CD talking during Super Bowl weekend as well. A lot to get to on this episode of the Gray Area. And I appreciate you hanging out with me. I know it's been a while since your man has been on on the mic and on the camera talking something other than the Dallas Mavericks. I'm, of course, the Mavericks pre- and post-game host on 97.1 The Freak on the Dallas Mavericks Radio Network. So been kind of busy these last few days and really for the last week or so because all things with the NBA trade deadline, trade talks specifically around the Mavericks. Were they? Would they? Did they? They did make moves at the NBA trade deadline. So been kind of busy with that. So I know people have been asking me, Kevin, where's Friends Friday with Reg? Where's the podcast? What's going on? Your man been a little busy with the Mavericks and everything else as well. So when I do get on here, I want to make sure I take the time to hang out with y'all because there's a lot to talk about. I didn't even get a chance to even preview the Super Bowl going into the game between the Chiefs and the 49ers. But... If you watched me and seen me on Twitter, your man's prediction was only one point off. I picked the Chiefs to win 24 to 22 over the San Francisco 49ers. And guess what? Chiefs win 25 22 in an overtime thriller where the Chiefs now have won their third Super Bowl championship in the last five years. They've been to the Super Bowl four out of the last five years. And Patrick Mahomes now has put himself in position where his Chiefs are now a dynasty. The Chiefs were able to, in a down year where they lost six times, still were able to win at home against the Miami Dolphins, then go on the road to take out Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills, then do it again by beating Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens in their own building, and then take out a San Francisco 49er team that was favored going into the Super Bowl. And we'll get into all the stuff and the hyperbole when it comes to Patrick Mahomes because I don't know if there's enough adjectives and enough superlatives to describe 15 at this point because he was absolutely sensational in the game on Sunday. But this is about Kansas City and their organization. Andy Reid, who's now won his third Super Bowl in his 60s, has continued to find ways to remake himself as a coach and continue to help this team remain at the top of the National Football League. Andy Reid reminds you a lot of a guy I like to call Chris Jericho. You might have heard him, professional wrestler. One of the things I love about Jericho is that throughout his amazing career in professional wrestling, he's continued to remake himself over and over and over again and still remain at the top of the business at times. Same way with the guys like, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, John Cena, whomever you want to think about in professional wrestling, those individuals have been able to recreate who they are to still remain connected to their audience and, more importantly, stay at the top of their business. Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs have done that now for four out of the last five years getting to the Super Bowl. And in this particular game, where in the first half it was a defensive slugfest where both defenses were absolutely on fire, A lot of fun in the first half. Then the offense has started to take over in the second half. The Chiefs were led this season by defense. Steve Spagnuolo and his defense dialed up pressure at the right time on Brock Purdy when they needed to, especially in the red zone. And that really felt like was the difference for San Francisco. They couldn't convert in the red zone when they really needed to because you got to score touchdowns against the Chiefs. And when you don't, and you give Patrick Mahomes time, he's going to lead you to an opportunity to get a field goal to go into overtime. And then when you give him the ball back after you kick another field goal to take a lead, he's going to drive you all the way down the field and find McCole Hardman in the end zone with three seconds left in the game to win yet another Super Bowl. 
Then let me start with San Francisco and Kyle Shanahan. Now, folks are going to crush Shanahan because he took the ball to begin overtime. And I think, okay, maybe you can because we've come to find out now that his boys didn't understand how the overtime rules work, to which I say that's coaching malpractice. I'm not going to lie to you. I had said it on Twitter, and I felt like when I watched the game and was looking at the way things were going down for San Francisco, I thought Kyle Shanahan, for the most part, coached a pretty good game. But you say, Kevin, for the third time, Kyle Shanahan's had a double-digit lead when it's mattered most, and they've lost two times as a head coach with the San Francisco 49ers, yes to the Kansas City Chiefs. And you remember that one time when he was an offensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons where they were up 28-3, to and they couldn't hold that lead either. To which I say, yeah, factually, yeah, you're right. Kyle Shanahan, for some reason, can't find a way to close out games up double digits in the biggest game that the NFL has to offer. And he's done it multiple times now. And if you want to call it a choke job, all right, maybe you call it a choke job. But for him to take the ball in overtime, I didn't think it was necessarily a bad decision. I understood it based off of what just happened. His defense was gassed after they gave up an opportunity to get a field goal and the Chiefs were able to convert to send the game into overtime. So he's thinking, I guess, let me get this offense on the field. We can score. And then my defense knows what they have to do in order to try and win and end this ball game. Except you only got a field goal. Now, I give Brock Purdy credit. Purdy played decently throughout the course of the football game. Now, there were times in the second half where he did not look good at all. First half seemed to be playing pretty well. He got comfortable fairly early on, but it points in the second half wasn't great. But the last two times that Brock Purdy walked off the football field with his offense, the 49ers had a lead. And it didn't work out in the end for the 49ers, who've got a lot of soul searching for that organization to do. And I'll get back to them here in a moment. But for the Chiefs now, they are a bona fide dynasty, three titles in five years. Patrick Mahomes, a three-time Super Bowl MVP by the age of 28, and now has solidified himself as the GOAT. And now I've heard a lot of comparisons, and I tend to agree with some of them for sure when we look at the way that Mahomes has done it. Because I was one of the ones who wondered, could he get this done in the postseason? Remember, coming into this postseason, Patrick Mahomes had never, ever played a road playoff game. Not only did he go on the road, he took out Josh Allen and and Lamar Jackson on the way to beating and winning against the San Francisco 49ers for a second time. And now you look at what he's done to the entire AFC in ways to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl now. He has taken out all the dudes that you and I consider to be the best quarterbacks, not just in the AFC, but really in the entire NFL. Think about it. He's now taken out on his way to winning Super Bowls, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, he's taken out to a tongue of ILO as well, and he's done it in every conceivable way possible. The Chiefs, for some reason, find themselves exactly where they want to be when they're down double digits in the playoffs. It's absurd the calm and the poise at which Patrick Mahomes continues to play in these situations. It's nothing like we've really ever seen. At least say, Kevin, what about that one dude named Thomas Edward Patrick Brady? Yeah, he was pretty damn good. But when you watch Mahomes and the flair at which he does it with, the creativity at which he plays the game with, it's Michael Jordan-esque based on for what he does. And for Mahomes now, he has a chance to continue to be on one of the greatest runs that we've ever seen. You look at the opening of his career. He's been in the AFC Championship game each and every year that he's been a starter in the NFL. Four Super Bowl appearances, three championships, three Super Bowl MVPs, been a league MVP twice already, and has considered himself and is considered now, at least by me and many, already the greatest quarterback to ever play the game. Again, you say, Kevin, what about Tom Brady? Seven Super Bowl championships, the amount of records that he has, winning Super Bowls with two different franchises. And I get it. Tom Brady is considered 
the greatest winner that we've ever seen in professional football. But he never had the talent of a Patrick Mahomes and the amount of immediate success that Patrick Mahomes has had. Patrick Mahomes has arguably had the greatest start to an NFL career in the history of the sport. I just laid out some of the reasons why based on some of the accolades that he's already achieved, and he's not even close to 30 yet. And here's the big question I have for you and I going forward here. Who the hell's about to stop all this? Because the Chiefs looked around after they won a Super Bowl and were like, you know what? We can do this and continue to do this without Tyreek Hill. In fact, they got rid of Tyreek Hill, had the audacity to go win a Super Bowl, and then they turn around and do it again. This is a team whose receivers led the league in drops this year. Offensive line at times was suspect, but the defense was as good as it's ever been in the Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes era. Chris Jones, an absolute monster in the middle. You've got guys like Carlothis, Nick Bolton, a terrific secondary with McDuffie and Sneed and Edwards. They've got a great defense that they were able to lean on, and you saw them lean on it time and time again in the Super Bowl, holding that vaunted San Francisco 49er offense to 22 points, and in their last two drives, just six points altogether. So for a defense that is as good as it was, They've got the best quarterback in the sport, the best tight end in the sport as well, because, you know, that was the other backdrop to all of this, the whole Swifty Bowl when it came to Taylor Swift and her man, Travis Kelsey, to which, let me put a pin in that real quick. Hey, y'all got to relax, man. Travis Kelsey trying to live his best life, playing in Super Bowls, winning championships, fighting for his right to party, and y'all out here hating on that man's relationship with Taylor Swift. I don't know what it is, but y'all got to chill. There's nothing better than seeing a young man being out there, enjoying himself with his girl, winning titles. And may, you know what? Maybe that's it. Y'all sick of seeing Travis Kelsey get the girl, win the title, and live his best life all the time. To which I say, get the head out your heart, man. Let that cat live. Let his girl live. And let them be happy because they are having the time of their lives right now. And Travis Kelsey, who has balled out in his playoff career, did so again, especially in the second half. Combination of Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes is virtually unstoppable in this league. And it was on display again. And he definitely outshined George Kittle on the other side for the San Francisco 49ers. So for Patrick Mahomes now, he puts himself in rarefied air, not just as a quarterback in the NFL, but really when you look at all the sports. And the most apt comparison that I have basically to what he's doing right now, and you look at it the way Jordan did it. Jordan shut out guys like Carl Malone, John Stockton, Patrick Ewing, Gary Payton, any number of individuals that you want to think of where he kept them from winning championships. That's kind of what Patrick Mahomes is doing right now. And let them have the nerve to three-peat next year. Andy Reid said he's already coming back for another year. Travis Kelsey said, I'm not going anywhere, trying to get this three-peat. The Chiefs were the first team in 20 years to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls, and I have no qualm about the idea that they could do it again, which is kind of frightening because if Jackson couldn't do it in his own building, Allen couldn't do it again in his own building, you had – you knew Tua Tunga Vailoa and the Miami Dolphins had no shot in hell trying to do that in Kansas City with that cold weather, going to Arrowhead and trying to win a game there. You knew that wasn't going to happen. And the only one that you could think of who's really had his number in terms of Patrick Mahomes in his career is Joe Burrow. And Joe Burrow couldn't even finish the season because of an injury. So maybe if you're looking for a hope to be some kind of kryptonite to Patrick Mahomes' Superman, Joe Burrow might be the only cat that can do it, but you'll have to wait till next year to do that. And even if Mahomes runs into Joe Burrow once again, it appears that the Chiefs have a defense that's ready to deal with Joe Burrow, T. Higgins, if he's there, Jamar Chase, and what they present in Cincinnati. Short of that, I don't know who beats him. San Francisco couldn't do it as well as they played defensively, especially in the first half. Christian McCaffrey with an electrifying touchdown. Jawan Jennings obviously played the game of his life. But the miscues that the San Francisco 49ers had, 
the punt that hit the player's foot that wound up leading to the Chiefs recovering it. Then Patrick Mahomes throwing a touchdown pass on the very next play to Marquez Valdez-Scantling to the decisions that were made by Kyle Shanahan late in the football game and obviously in overtime. You can look at San Francisco as choke artists the way that they've handled this the last couple of times they played the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. But make no mistake about it, Patrick Mahomes took this Super Bowl away from Kyle Shanahan and the San Francisco 49ers. I didn't feel like San Francisco gave this game away. They just happened to run into a dude right now who is at the apex of his power. And for the NFL, I don't know what the rest of them do with it because Patrick Mahomes feels inevitable. When he snaps his fingers, things happen, and teams go into dust. And the way that the Kansas City Chiefs have now built themselves, whether it be with a defensive team, the way that they did this year, high-flying offenses in the first few years of the Patrick Mahomes era, they have built and adapt themselves to be the kind of flexible organization that can do anything. And here is how wild the Patrick Mahomes era is where they are right now. Thanks to Kay Adams for this particular note. Patrick Mahomes now becomes the first quarterback, the first player in NFL history to have the largest cap number on his football team and win a Super Bowl. The first quarterback to have the largest cap number to win a Super Bowl. They gutted that roster when it came to the wide receivers. Guys like Rasheed Rice, a rookie out of SMU. Shout out to him. Marquez Valdez-Scantley. Think about the Chiefs when they played on that Monday night game against the Philadelphia Eagles and Marquez Valdez-Scantley dropped the football that would have given them a win in Arrowhead against the Philadelphia Eagles, and he couldn't catch it. We thought, well, this receiver core isn't good enough. They dropped the football all the time. They beat themselves lining up offsides. Kadarius Toney, who didn't even play in the damn game on Sunday. And yet and still, 15 was inevitable. He took it. He dealt with it. Every punch that was thrown his way, he had a counter, and he delivered the knockout blow to a guy who was traded from the Jets back to the Chiefs and found his way winning the Super Bowl for Kansas City. Shout out to McCold Hardman. How about that? And now the Chiefs continue their dynastic run with appearing no one being in their way for any time soon. And if you're the Chiefs, Andy Reid, Clark Hunt, Brett Veach, the GM, Patrick Mahomes still may be underpaid for what he does for this team and his organization. For as good as they were on Sunday, it didn't appear that they would be that kind of team getting to the Super Bowl, and yet they did it in a star-studded game in Las Vegas where the NFL world descended upon Sin City and the Super Bowl delivered even the halftime show where Usher was spectacular. I don't care what y'all say about his breathing, him being out of breath, whatever y'all was trying to say, Usher killed that Super Bowl. In fact, real quick, Usher, top five Super Bowl already. Yep, I put it up there. Obviously, what was it, 2007 with Prince, 93 with Michael Jackson. What was it, Beyonce Super Bowl back in 2012. Obviously, in 2022, the Los, uh, Los Angeles Super Bowl with Dr. Dre and his buddies out there. Yeah, Usher's Super Bowl performance was right up there in that conversation, his top five Super Bowl about, halftime show of all time. I don't care what you say. Debate it with your mama. But Patrick Mahomes delivered the closing show in Super Bowl 58 and now have a chance to go for three in a row in New Orleans next year. And honestly, I don't know who stops him at this point. Speaking of the Super Bowl, it wouldn't be a Super Bowl week without the Cowboys being at the forefront of news off the field when it comes to teams not playing in the Super Bowl. I don't know how Jerry Jones does. He does it year after year, no matter what. His team, who hasn't been in the damn game since, what, I don't know, almost three decades now, still finds a way to have their players or their organization make news. Now, look, I'm not going to get into the whole Mike Zimmer, Rex Ryan jump off because that's just another day at the circus for the Dallas Cowboys. The report being 
that Mike Zimmer took the job and was given the job as the Cowboys defensive coordinator, at least according to Adam Schefter of ESPN, to which Rex Ryan said, uh, actually, Adam, no, that's not right. The job isn't his. In fact, the Cowboys are still talking to me about the job. As we've come to find out on Monday that Rex Ryan has re-engaged apparently the Cowboys in potentially getting that job. Whatever. I don't really give a damn at this point. Pick one and move on because the Cowboys offseason has already been three years too long and we're not even a full month in it yet. Back to the Cowboys, though, in terms of their headlines. Micah Parsons, who hosts his podcast, The Edge, on Bleacher Report, sat down and had his buddy C.D. Lamb on his show during Super Bowl weekend in Las Vegas. Now, he did talk to Jordan Love and C.J. Stroud. Before I get to what C.D. Lamb and Micah had to say, let me tell you something. I know these dudes are buddies. I know it's a completely different era when you see these players out here exchanging jerseys, kiki and ha ha after games and having all kinds of fun and conversations appearing on each other's shows in this whole podcast era. Shout out to me. We're doing a podcast like all of this. I get it. It's a completely different era, different time, different age. Dudes are buddy, buddy. No problem. No harm. No foul. But let me tell you something. And I don't know who needs to hear this. When I have a podcast of my own, shout out to me, we do here. And if I was a player and I watched Jordan Love walk into my building, beat my team's ass all down, up and down every single time they got on the football field at at and Stadium and beat my defense to a bloody pulp and they walked out with a playoff win, in my own building as a seven seed when I had not lost a home game in two years in my building. Guess who I'm not trying to talk to? I don't care how cool we are. Jordan Love, we're not going to have to do this. We're not about to do this podcast today. I'm sorry. I don't care how cool we are. I don't know how much we're friends. I don't care. If I'm Michael Parsons, personally, personally speaking, I'm not talking to Jordan Love. I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to even think about you for a little bit at least not until we get a little bit deeper into the offseason. Because all of those feelings, at least for me, I'm a competitive person, as you can tell, all those feelings well up in me once again once I saw your face come across my name from a podcast. I'm not doing it. We're not talking. But again, it's a different time. It's a different age. Let me take a deep breath. Woo-sa. Micah Parsons had Jordan Love on his podcast. Kumbaya. And good, good for Micah, I guess. He got Jordan Love to reveal the game plan, I guess, that the Packers had for the Cowboys. Maybe he should have done that before that they got on the show together, and maybe he could have maybe got some information there. I'm just joking. I know that wasn't going to happen. The point remains the same. A competitor in me doesn't want to talk to the dude that just beat my team in my building during the playoffs. Sorry, not trying to talk to you. And maybe that's my uh, slightly old age showing. See him as now I'm what, uh, 38? 8, 37? I can't remember. Something like that. I'm 37 because I'm not 36 anymore. Anyway, C.D. Lamb, though, did jump on the podcast with Micah, The Edge, on Bleacher Report, and they talked about what the Cowboys need to do this offseason. C.D. Lamb also addressing the elephant of the room that his mom did make, in fact, those comments criticizing Dak Prescott on Facebook. He said, look, man, I don't answer from my mom. She said what she said. She was a fr- She was frustrated. She was just being a mom, okay? She said what she said. It is what it is. We move on. The C.D. Lamb did say and reiterate that he wants to be a cowboy for life. He wants to be one of the highest paid wide receivers in the NFL, which he deserves to be based on the productivity that he had this year, breaking the Cowboys team records for receptions and receiving yards in a single season. But this is for a Cowboys team now that's got some real decisions to make. We've heard reported over the weekend that Dak Prescott is expected to have a deal done that will make him one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the history of the NFL and, of course, currently in the National Football League, which makes a lot of sense. Dak Prescott was second in MVP voting behind Lamar Jackson, had a career year with Mike McCarthy running this offense. And for a guy in Prescott who led the NFL in interceptions the previous season, then comes back this season and leads the NFL in touchdown passes. Yeah, 
while in year eight, he didn't have the deep playoff run that you and I wanted him to have, at least if you're a Cowboys fan, that is, you're not going to get much better than what you've got in Dak Prescott right now. And for all of y'all, yes, y'all, who don't want Dak Prescott around here, I understand in some ways the frustration given the fact that this quarterback hasn't been able to take the Cowboys to where they believe their birthright is, which is the Super Bowl, or not even to the NFC Championship game. Trust me, I get it. I really do. But y'all got to relax. The Cowboys are in a place right now where they've got decisions to make. Paying Dak Prescott, getting CeeDee Lamb his new deal, Micah Parsons, if he really wanted to push the envelope, could get a new deal as well if he wanted to. What to do with Tony Pollard? How are you going to address your needs at linebacker? There's a lot of things that the Cowboys have got to address, but the one thing that they have got to do, shut up. All of this talking for years and years and years. Micah's doing talking now. Everybody seems like they're doing talking, even Demarcus Lawrence, and this is where I'm ultimately getting to here today. Demarcus Lawrence went on first take, and they were asking him, Shannon Sharp, Stephen A. Smith, what happened in the Packers playoff game? Demarcus Lawrence, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, talked to him. Great dude. Good leader. Great football player. And I don't know if he was trying to soften things up or just trying to pass over the question or whatever the case may be, but the answer that he gave was tone deaf when he said, oh, you know, we were kind of tired, kind of burnt out. And the Packers had a good game plan, and they just took it to us. What the hell? The last thing that anybody, any Cowboy fan, any respected Cowboy fan who has put themselves through this torture rack of emotion with this team over the past three decades, the last thing they want to hear from that dude on that team who had the two seed with the chance to get deep into the playoffs talking about we tired what look the cowboys have won 12 games each of the last three years they've been one of the best teams record wise in the nfl they've got some of the most talent on the nfl for any roster you think about all the all pros that they've got running around on that team on both sides of the football and to give out the lame poor excuse that you were tired tired my guy Tired is when you watch yourself have to work four or five different jobs to try and make things. Look, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Here's the point. The point is that excuse just doesn't fly for a team that's got a bunch of a built-in excuses that they try to come up with each and every time that they lose a playoff game. Oh, the pressure of the star, the amount of distractions that are around here. All of these things or signed up for when you become a Dallas Cowboy. Now, again, I'm not speaking out of turn here. Cover this team, watch this team, currently cover this team, and I understand what goes on around in that building. I've had family members play for the organization. There's pressure, a certain pressure that comes with playing for the Dallas Cowboys, but that doesn't mean that you offer up the kinds of excuses that this team is done with, and they've got to find within themselves a way to stop all the talking and start doing. Micah Parsons, CeeDee Lamb, Dak Prescott, DeMarcus Lawrence, all of these players who we consider true, really good football players, and they are, have got to find a way to just do it now. Because all the talking and all the fatigue that Cowboys fans are experiencing, they're over it. I have not experienced, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to say this, especially after what happened a couple of years ago when they lost at home to the San Francisco 49ers in that wild card game. This is about a despondent as a franchise and fan base I've seen probably ever. The Cowboys as a fan base is tired. The anger, the vitriol, all the things that have beset this team and franchise based on the way fans feel about them are justified at this point. And now you got a damn circus trying to figure out who in the world is going to be the defensive coordinator moving forward for a lame duck coach who may not even be back after the 2024 season, which is the backdrop of all of this. Mike McCarthy, who knows or at least does know how to do this in January and has done it before, hasn't been able to do it since taking over as Cowboys head coach. 
The question is, will he be able to learn how to do it for this team to find a way for him not only to keep his job, but have the confidence that he can be the guy that does it going forward from 2024 and beyond? Because guess what? His coaching staff has been gutted. Dan Quinn, gone. Aiden Durde, gone. Joe Witt Jr., see you later. A lot of coaches on that defensive side are out the door, and they've got to find a way to replace these guys, and they still haven't done it yet. And yet, what is still the common denominator for the Dallas Cowboys? Jerry Jones sitting there at the top of all this, trying to figure out how come his team can't do what the Kansas City Chiefs have done, what the New England Patriots have done. You say, Kevin, San Francisco's got an even longer championship drought than the Dallas Cowboys. I don't give a damn. I don't cheer and I don't cover the Dallas, the San Francisco 49ers. I do for the Dallas Cowboys. And here they are. America's favorite circus. Not America's favorite team. Not America's team. Because Kansas City has pretty much gotten that on lock now. They're America's clown show. The amount of laughing that all of us have done at this team again this year should anger those who play for this team and, more importantly, who are trying to put a team on the field that's trying to win a championship. Because guess what? I got to laugh to keep from crying, and the same sentiment I'm sure it's felt by a lot of Cowboys fans. But for Micah, CD, and others, find a way to just do, just do now. Because that's what it's all about. I don't care if you've got a podcast. I don't care if you go out talking and put yourself in the space because that's what time it is in today's sports media landscape, especially for athletes, controlling their own story and narrative. I get it, and I kind of like it. I want to hear from you. You tell me directly how you feel. A lot of these guys are media savvy now, but when it comes to the point where it appears to be interfering with the way that these teams, or players, I should say, play on the field, and not to say that it is, but the appearance of it feels that way, something has got to change. And if it doesn't, the Cowboys will continually find themselves watching the likes of San Francisco, Kansas City, and others, focusing on what matters most. And that's what struck me about the Chiefs and Travis Kelsey and what he had to talk about after the Super Bowl. They focus on the task at hand. And you say, Kevin, Travis Kelsey has a podcast of his own. For some reason, though, he's been able to help tune it out and put himself in a position where he's winning championships year after year, it feels like. And yes, I know he's catching balls from the best quarterback maybe to have ever lived. The point remains the same. Focus on the main thing if you're the Cowboys. And maybe that means leaving the microphones to us and you playing the games the way that they need to be played. But what do I know? I just watch, I just cover the team, and hope deep down in my little blue and silver heart that at some point I can watch my team on that stage holding the Lombardi Trophy. But as we've come to find out, maybe I shouldn't hold my breath when it comes to the Cowboys, because guess what? They're certainly not holding theirs. Before I get out of here today, just want to touch on the Dallas Mavericks. The Mavericks playing some good ball these days, boys and girls. They've won four straight games as of this recording. They take on the Washington Wizards on Monday before they welcome in Victor Wimbanyama and the San Antonio Spurs on Wednesday as they get ready to move toward the All-Star break. And the Mavericks made a couple of moves at the NBA trade deadline. They got P.J. Washington from the Charlotte Hornets, and they got Daniel Gafford from the Washington Wizards in a trade market that really wasn't all that, you know, buzzworthy this NBA season. Some of the bigger trades had already happened with Pascal Siakam going to the Pacers and OG Ananobi going to the New York Knicks. OG Ananobi dealing with a little bit of injury right now. And obviously we've seen what the trade deadline may look like or what it did look like, I should say. And it really wasn't all that eventful. A lot of minor moves, but at the same time, the Mavericks and the Knicks, I would probably consider the two biggest winners of the NBA trade deadline. The Knicks were able to acquire Bogdan, Boyan Bogdanovich. I always get the Bogdanoviches confused. Boyan Bogdanovich from the Pistons and Alec Burks from the Pistons as well. Mavericks is a Michigan and Washington and Gafford. And for the sake of our conversation, 
you know, for the Dallas Mavericks, I like the moves. If you listen to my podcast inside the Mavs, you know that Washington and Gafford have been names I've been talking about for quite some time for the Mavericks and what they've needed to address their front court. A front court that hasn't been very good for quite some time behind Derek Lively, who's had a terrific rookie season so far. He's right now dealing with a broken nose. But for the Mavericks moving forward here, they got their first win with Gafford and Washington on Saturday when they blew out the Oklahoma City Thunder by 35 at the AAC. This now, for me, falls on Jason Kidd. Jason Kidd, who took his Dallas Mavericks to the Western Conference Finals in his first season. Of course, they missed the playoffs altogether last year after tanking in the final parts of the regular season to ensure that they were able to keep their pick, and it's turned out well because they do have Derek Lively the second now. But with the moves with Washington and Gafford, while, yes, may not be the big blockbuster moves that we've seen typically in years past in the NBA, these moves made sense for their roster right now. And Washington, who had 14 points and five rebounds in 24 minutes, was a plus 24 in his debut. Daniel Gafford, who was a monster in the third quarter, finished the game with 19 points, nine rebounds in 17 minutes of play, doing all the stuff that the Mavericks were hoping they would get from a guy in Gafford who's killed them over the last couple of years. And Washington, who has a lot of upside as a guy that provides them size and a little bit of length at the power forward position and some athleticism and explosion as well. But now for Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, who, of course, are two best players on this team, they now have a roster, it appears, that goes about 10 deep. Can Dante Exum get back healthy? He's been dealing with knee soreness and injury now for the last couple of weeks. Everybody appears to have a broken nose on this team. Maxi Kleba, Luka Doncic, Derek Lively the second, Dwight Powell stay getting hit in the face all the time. But if the Mavericks can get healthy, and right now they sit eighth in the Western Conference, maybe they can get themselves to the top six and solidify themselves a playoff spot in the West without having to with having to avoid the play in. Now look, the West at the very top right now is really good. Nuggets, Clippers, who have probably been the best team in the league since about mid-November. You've got the Nuggets, Timberwolves, Thunder still in the top four there. You still got teams like the Pelicans have been playing really well as of late. The Phoenix Suns, who have gotten things turned around with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal. The Mavericks are playing in a West right now, but even if they're with them being seven games over 500 at 30 and 23, still got a lot of work to do. And the defense has got to find a way during the post all star break to continue to get better. Now, give them credit, they held the Thunder to 38% shooting on Saturday, which was a season low for the Thunder all season. So maybe that defense can turn the corner, especially dealing with one of the best offenses in the league and a team in the Thunder that's top five in both offensive and defensive rating so far this year. They took it to them. In fact, they scored 47 points in the first quarter, which is a franchise record for them. But for the Mavericks now, a team with a bunch of expectations, a top five talent literally in Luka Doncic, can they now start to answer the call? But you look at the future of this team, we've got a good young core. Luka Doncic at 25 years of age. Derek Lively, who just now turned 20 years old. Josh Green in his early 20s. Same with Jaden Hardy as well. Daniel Gafford, P.J. Washington, both of which are 25 years of age. They've got a young group here that can now grow together and most importantly are now under contract. Now, what they gave up in order to get to this point, you can debate and criticize if you want to, especially prior to how they had to get Washington and Gafford because they swung and missed on Grant Williams, who now is a member, of course, of the Charlotte Hornets. Remember, they gave up a pit, pick swap in terms of what San Antonio did in order to help facilitate that deal. So when you look at the years 2027 through 2030, Mavericks really don't have much control over their first-round picks. They gave up their 2027 first-rounder in order to get P.J. Washington, which is a lightly protected now first-round pick. They had to give up their 2029 first rounder, of course, to go get Kyrie Irving last year. I mentioned the pick swaps already. They better hope this works, and that's ultimately what this comes down to. While, yes, Nico Harrison has been willing to make big, bold moves to try and improve this Mavericks team, now they got to work. 
It didn't work when they were able to get, you know, Spencer didn't win. It did work. Let me back up. It did work for a hot second there. They were able to get to the Western Conference Finals in the first year. They got Kyrie Irving. We know how things went during the second half last year. Injury, tanking out the rest of the year. They missed the playoffs altogether. But now they've got to make this work going forward here because you really don't have a lot of controllable assets for the foreseeable future for your team. They still haven't had the Christos Porzingis pick convey yet to the New York Knicks. So while there have been mixed results for Jason Kidd and his basketball team so far, Nico Harrison and Mark Cuban better hope and pray that this stuff works because you're working on a timeline where Luka Doncic looks around in 2026 and who knows what decision he will make. I ultimately do believe, just to give you my thought on that real quick, that Luka Doncic isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But last year was about the amount of step back that this organization could take and they took it in a significant way. There's no more step backs that the Mavericks can take moving forward in the Luka Doncic era. And the Mavericks decided to go all in somewhat by getting P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford, whom you're hoping, especially in Washington's case, that he realizes the upside of potential that he has. An athletic four that can shoot a little bit from three, not nearly as consistently as you want to as a 32, 33% three-point shooter. But hopefully with the amount of wide open looks that he's going to get, he'll be able to improve on that percentage. You know, he could take the ball to the basket, but can he be a high level defender that really increases the ceiling of the Mavericks defensively? And if he can be, Mavericks may have struck something here going forward in this era. But only time will tell, but the Mavericks are playing some of their best basketball of the season right now. If they are able to get to that five or six game winning streak, they go into the all-star break with some real momentum and they'll need it because once they get done with the all-star break, the first team that they see will be their rival, the Phoenix Suns with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal. Not an easy way to start your post all-star break schedule. That's why it's important that they stack the wins against the Phoenix, or excuse me, the Washington Wizards and the San Antonio Spurs to get things moving, continuously moving in the right direction. And if so, Mavericks could potentially make some noise because they become the proverbial, we don't want to see that team in the playoffs. We always talk about the dangerous teams that are out there. Mavericks could be one of them if this whole P.J. Washington, Daniel Gafford thing turns into what we think it could. So far, the results have been really nice for them. After one game, after destroying, that was the Oklahoma City Thunder on Saturday in a 35-point beat him down at the AAC. But look, Jason Kidd, Nico Harrison, Mark Cuban, the Dumont family who owns this team now, they need this ish to work and to work quickly. Because if they don't, oh boy, they got a lot of questions to answer moving forward. But so far, so good. Results so far, not bad for P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford. But you give the Mavericks credit for making the moves and getting it done the way that they needed to in order to handle business. Time will tell what those moves will look like for the rest of the season. By the way, before I get out of here, you know how we were talking about the whole Cowboys drama thing a little bit earlier in the midst of while we were recording this show? Mike Zimmer is officially now the Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator. So at least one piece of circus has now been put to bed because we were talking about a little bit earlier, you know, that whole circus of all things that's happened between the Cowboys. It hasn't even been a full off season yet. Well, at least that part has now been put to bed. Shout out to them for going, you know, circa early 2000s, bringing Mike Zimmer back as our defensive coordinator, which for a team that's got as much tries to move forward, you know, progressive and all this other stuff when it comes to their players and that kind of thing, they sure do love a nostalgia hire. I'm not saying Mike Zimmer isn't a good defensive coordinator. I'm not saying that. Don't you clip this saying Kevin said that Mike Zimmer wasn't a defense, good defensive coordinator. Good defensive mind. Really good defensive mind. But my goodness, they love a nostalgia hire or somebody used to work for the organization. Never forget, this is a current organization of the Dallas Cowboys whose current offensive line coach was the assistant old line coach when Tom Landry was still coaching. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here. But good for Mike Zimmer. Back with the Dallas Cowboys. We'll see how it works out. All right. 
I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go rewatch Usher's halftime show because, you know, that was incredible. No matter what y'all haters got to say about it. Top five halftime show of all time. So I'm going to go and leave here and go rewatch that. But hopefully you enjoyed today's episode of the Gray Area Podcast. Again, you can download and subscribe to the Gray Area wherever you get podcasts for free. Give it a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there. Like and comment on the video as well. Check out all my Mavs content on Inside the Mavs as well. And you can also do that on my YouTube channel here at Kevin Gray Sports. Until next time, I'll talk to you later. Peace.